Good evening, folks, and welcome to the Thursday night edition of Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Al Huey, along with my partner, Robert Ironman, and our special guest tonight is Mr. Tom Conaway. Thank yes. you for joining us, Tom. Pleasure to have you. Yeah. Mr. Conaway uh, happens to be a property owner out there off of Brown Road. Uh, he grows pistachios, and you've been doing this for a little while now, right? Yes. Probably pushing 40 years now. 40 years? 40 years. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, you've looked into this water issue uh, pretty pretty much in depth. Yes, I've been compiled a years. lot of information. So why don't we just open it up to you and uh, let me know what you'd like to share. I, I understand you uh, recently contacted the Planning Commission and gave them uh, some information. So why don't you share with us what you shared with them? Uh, yes, I'll do that. I'd like to start a little bit from the beginning here, though. That would be uh, good. Sure. Um, I started back, I retired off the, w with the Navy back in 93, but I started uh, accumulating property and doing farming part-time around 1970. I came out here in 1967 with my family and five young children and, and and we all started out living on the base because there really wasn't much housing here. And then when we moved out in the town, I started farming part-time and really got into pistachios probably in the late 80s. Okay. okay. Before that, I've tried all kinds of other things like apricots and so on. But pistachios became a very solid growing product because it's a desert plant. And it showed that it could adjust to this kind of climate much more so than many of the other deciduous fruits. Uh, the biggest thing that came about was we wound up have been able to get a contract with a grower and a processor over in Los Hills on his Paramount Farms. And a couple of us local people uh, all started about the same time. And uh, that became really our biggest push for us because we had someone we could sell to once the product could sustain itself. And most of us started out really with small acreage and built onto it as time went. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, the few of us that started, we all we were all technical types, and we did this as a as a part time basis to start with, and uh, and all looking for it to be our retirement kind of activities. Okay. And uh, and that's what we all led up to be, and that's basically. Uh, what we're doing now. Uh, so, no one uh, at that time, and uh, when I hear that we went overdraft in the 60s, anyone ever brought up we had a water issue. Right. In fact, we were encouraged to to grow and bring in some independent product, okay? Right. Uh, uh, by the community, okay. because we produced work for people, you know, mm -hmm. we had tractors, we had equipment that needed repairs, so we started bringing work slowly as we grew into mm -hmm. the community for labor and, and materials and so on. Uh, that grew over time because we all had to continue to add to our acreage to get to a, 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 an average size. A, a, a productive commercial farm is around 100 acres. Okay. If you are not along that size commercially for like a tree crop, your overhead and your products and your growth aren't balanced properly. Okay. okay? So that's what we all work towards. Um, so the so the pieces of property grew. In my example, I have 30 pieces of property. When this rezoning 
was proposed, every one of those pieces of property had been uh, proposed to take it out of agriculture. Not yes. just one, all 30 parcels, okay? And change it to and, light and, industrial? Right, to light industrial. With a... Uh, which is A1, I mean M1, with also the other piece being uh, precision development, okay? Which says that anything you add to that industrial light industry, you have to get permits for, as I understand it. Okay. And so, along with it being uh, the rezoning change, they were uh, saying they're going to give you a letter of legal non-conforming. We, we were told we would be we would be able to sustain our farming operation, but we would be under what is called legal, uh, but non-conforming. Right. Okay. Uh, they had two alternatives. One being you could be legal, non-conforming for as long as you can see out in the future, or it could have a time limit put on it. Uh, that so second Johnny one that second one put some uncertainty to us right. and in a lot of concern. Because you uh, need, need to understand, folks, that they're saying they're going to give these letters of legal nonconforming, but there's been no stipulation regarding if there's any time limit. Right. Uh, if or if no it's time limit. Or if it's permanent. Yeah. Or if it's yeah. permanent, right. What happens with next year when the county changes yeah. its mind? Exactly, that's what I was getting at. If, if they don't put a time limit on it, then six months, a year, two years, they could pull those letters back and you'd be out yeah. of business. The, the one thing I wanted to point out in, in building onto small pieces of property, out of these 30 pieces of property, most of my land is all adjoining. Okay, so okay. I start with two and a half acre pieces of parcel, or parcels, and probably the largest piece I have, one or two, is maybe up to 20 acres. I think I have one that's 25 acres. Most of them are in the 10, 15 acre, two and a half acre parcels. Most of these parcels are on the east side of Brown Road, on the east side of the railroad, Abandoned railroad track that's a, still an easement. Mm -hmm. Okay, those pieces of land were acquired because um, there's no power over there. There's no utilities, no water. I was back in the early 70s when I started. I was able to bring power across We're going to have to hold you up right there, Tom. We have to go to the evil thing, actually a good thing, called the commercial break. Okay. So we'll be right back. Join us. And welcome back to the Thursday evening edition of Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Robert Ironman along with fellow host Al Huey. And we're here this evening with Mr. Tom Conaway, a uh, long time um, pistachio grower here in the valley. And you were talking about your properties when we had to go to break. Yeah, for example, out of these small parcels that are all adjoining, uh, I was able to bring water to all of these parcels that had no power and I could bring my water and connect everything as a farmer and do that through what I call an integrated irrigation system. You make all these parcels industrial, you stop me from farming, those parcels have no value because most of them, out of all my 30 parcels, only three of them have power and water to them. All the rest of those parcels are bare land. They are of no value individually, even that each one has an individual parcel, county parcel number. Mm -hmm. So as a light industry value, it has no value if it doesn't have power and utilities to right. it. Right. <laughs> it has a value if all the parcels were sold together as a light industry single parcel. Uh -huh. But 
then that individual would have to use 100 acres as one industrial piece for a warehouse. That's one big warehouse. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> so, you know, breaking that up into small parcels for light industry doesn't seem to make sense to me. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, but, but I use it to make sense because I could make that land be productive to me because all I had to do was bring water to it to farm. Right. I didn't have to bring the utilities to every piece. Sure. Because all I had to do was bring the water and then put the crop onto it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so I pointed that out in <clears throat> my response letters back to the uh, uh, to the people that needed the response on the EIR and the uh, and their planning document. Okay. So. I had to make sure they understood that when they, when they, when they asked for a response on on this change of of zoning. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was one issue. The other issue to me is when you take me out of agriculture, I have a lot of commitments to what I call as my partners that I have to deal with, my financial institutions. I have a large commercial well I just put in. It is, it is under a long-term loan that doesn't even get closure on it till 2029. Okay. Okay, and, and if for some reason under legal non-conforming you put a, you take me out of farming, I haven't got a, 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 a something to hold that loan and commitment to because my lands are tied up in an appraisal and a, in a commitment to support that loan. So I had to go through an appraisal and put my land up to collateral for that large well loan because it was a very capital, big capital investment. So yeah, that's while one we're talking thing. about loans and the legal non-conforming, you were telling us if they didn't put a time limit on that legal non-conforming, it would be unlikely that anybody would loan you money, right? Because financial the fear of the right. county just pulling Financial that. institution says if they put a permit time on you, your loan commitments can only be the length of those permits. But what if the county doesn't put it in time? If they don't put a time frame on it, then I guess it's some uncertainty that you have to start working with them to. Yeah. You, you, have, to, you have to build some kind of confidence up that you're going to be around for some length of time. Right. 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 And, and, yeah. and, and the, the lender says, how do I know it's going to continue? And that is my collateral. Yeah. If you were to change the zoning on this, the value of it could collapse. I'm left well, holding well, the bank. My comment back on the zoning change is I don't see the zoning change for us in, in present agriculture as we are left to stay here and continue farming, but under a different name, under the zoning. Uh, I don't see how this affects the problem with water in this valley. You're not restricting me from using my wells. Right. You're not restricting me from putting less water on my crops. Correct. But you're changing my zoning that makes more uncertainty for me to do business. Correct. Why would you do that when when uh, when it's not really being required for improving the problem we have if we have an overdraft that's so critical. Right, and that's I completely agree with you. There's, there's, and, and the county has addressed that issue and they've said repeatedly that this rezoning will have zero impact on current water use. The only thing that it does is possibly <clears throat> Um, reduce future water use of people um, um, bringing in even more farmland. You know, I deal with a lot of people over in Bakersfield and I look at the groundwater management 
uh, charts that are presented and the overdraft that they show in the San Joaquin Valley. And it looks like a catastrophe over there. And I don't see anybody doing any rezoning and, and, and putting a big hype on, on how critical it is. Yet they say it is because there was very large drafts on water because of the shortage of the canal water they've been given. Yes. But yet I don't see any major moves by the county to put any, any kind of curtailment to them. Right. They're not, in other words, they have it, it, uh, other... I, I didn't say there's not concern. Right. But I didn't see any, and they're, and they're considered in high overdraft, not medium overdraft. Correct. Well, we have to go to another break. Um, so join us for our final segment uh, with, with Mr. Tom Conaway. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here again talking about water with Mr. Tom Conaway. He's a pistachio grower out there off of Brown Road. And before we left, uh, we were talking about uh, your properties. But, you know, what I think people need to hear and want to hear is how much water you're using out there. You know, all this uh, hype about uh, ag using all yeah. this water. And we were talking to you the other day. and. Why don't well, you talk to us a little bit well, about Well, for example, usage? when we finished harvest last year, uh, we shut our water off on the 15th of October. I have not turned the water on yet, and I don't expect to turn that on probably until about the 15th of April. Okay. So, so absolutely know, no water. No water at all has been put on. For, since I shut that off. So we usually can go at least a good seven months without putting water at all uh, to any of the trees. The trees are a desert tree. In fact, I've taken pictures of a California creosote bush and a wild pistachio bush in the wild, and you cannot tell the difference between the two when either one of them have had water for about five years. You cannot tell the difference. Wow. wow. Uh, in, in spite of that, we have been doing research, especially over in the San Joaquin Valley, what is called regulated deficit uh, irrigation. And we do that where we can reduce the water during proper times while, we're, while, we're, while the tree is growing mm -hmm. and producing, okay? And twice during the growing season, we can reduce the water uh, like between May and June and cut the water in half. So for a month and a half of this growing season, we can drop that water in half. And then after harvest, for another month and a half, we can drop it again in half. And in some cases, we can even drop it two thirds. So out of my six month or so growing season, I can buy myself another 50% less water of three more months of that six month to seven months. And it doesn't affect your so, crop. That, without it affecting the production of that crop. Amazing. Okay. It also is a tree that can grow on very saline water with very high boron, which we all know we have in this desert. It, can, it has been known to produce a crop with very little production effects up to one-third salt water. Wow. Okay, so it, it's a survivor. So if we had to respond for safety and for the safe yield, as people talk about, mm -hmm. you could shut this crop down and divert your water to the public's needs and not lose 
the long-term investment that takes 10 to, 10 to 12 years for this crop to produce. It would not destroy the crop. If you shut the water off to an almond grow, you would lose that. You, do you would that lose growth. the trees. You would not lose pistachio tree. And just as a reminder to our listeners, uh, this is the pistachio farmer. This next to the guest that we had a, a week or so ago, Zach Boardman. Yes. Uh, he lives between your pistachio farm and an alfalfa farm. And remember, Zach took soundings of his well and has had little notice of any water drop. In, in well. the water level, that's correct, yeah. yes. Okay, <laughs> and, and so uh, yeah, you, know, you have is, some maps here that yeah, I think are important yeah, for yeah. people to see. Well, let's come out of the groundwater sustainability programs, but that, okay. that's San Joaquin Valley. Let's hold it up for them. That's San Joaquin Valley. Okay. That's, that's Bakersfield right down there. Okay. And they are concerned because of the of the drought, and and a lot of wells have been sunk over there in the last year. When I had my new well put in, and that Bakersfield well driller left here, there was no way he was ever going to come back here because he was so busy over there. Wow. I think people were sinking wells indiscriminately over there. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. and I do not believe in us trying to live off over, live on groundwater. I don't believe farming can sus be sustained on groundwater alone. And I do believe we're going to have to find ways to bring water in from other places. But I also believe that's something we all can work towards. And I'm saying this crop, this possession crop, is an adjustable one that can live in this desert and work with people because I can pull that crop back and not lose it. If and, and, and speaking <coughs> of, of uh, working together to get more water, you were also talking to us the other day about you'd be willing to help invest towards that goal to, Absolutely. to get, you, get us off the groundwater as much it's as we it, 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 it has been a very, it's a, it's, we have a very good world market in it. It, it pays to grow a very, very well. And, uh, and as long as it would continue to do that and we can, and we can be a world producer from California on that, then you will take parts of that profit and put back in and if you have to pay more for water to bring it in that's the way it is yeah. and and you and would do that it's be, I and i think uh, we we all are anticipating you're not going to be paying 50 dollars an acre foot for water anymore and we're all knowing we're going to have to adjust for that i pay that for just pumping it out of the ground i pay over a hundred dollars an acre foot or two hundred dollars an acre foot just pay edison to get the water out of my wells Wow. So, wow. And, and yeah. before we have to go, I wanted to m mention again that all of these properties, uh, all of these uh, basins, some of them in critical overdraft, there's no rezoning going on. And that is also Kern County. We're not talking about a different county. We're talking about our own county. And they're not doing rezoning in areas of critical overdraft. So why are they doing it here? Well, I'm just going to show that. This map, uh, I think, Tom, it shows uh, wells. Uh, that are in trouble, right? This map here. Aquifer is in trouble. Well, the, uh, those, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, quickly. That's medium, you know, which we are. This is medium, the yellow. Okay. But and, we're blue. Heavy. But we're blue. Well, that's only because that just shows from the last one it didn't change. Oh, you go to okay. the other so one. Got, if you go to the other one, the, we're in medium. It hasn't okay. gone from we're, moderate to we're, we're, we're in medium overdraft. And if you looked at another one, the whole Central Valley is in heavy and medium. So, you know. Unfortunately, again, you know, we're out of we're time. We're out of time. Always. <laughs> Ran out of time too okay. soon. Well, thank you. Thanks again for coming you on. Bet. We appreciate you it. Bet. Thank you, Tom. Okay.